Grace and peace to you in the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome this morning to worship here at Front Street United Methodist Church. Uh, Pastors Ross and Patrick, we both greet you in the name of God. We're glad that you're together with us in this space today. A couple of announcements for you to take note of. You'll see them if you have your order of service pulled up. But our Bible, stu- our Bible study and coffee with a pastor uh, will continue on Wednesday mornings at 10 on Zoom. You can check the link for that uh, in your Front Street Happenings emails or go on the website. Uh, and we're going through the book of Luke right now. And so Pastor Ross is leading that. If you'd love to join in uh, live, you can do that. The, rest, the sessions are recorded. So if you want to, I've heard from some people that have watched them later in the evenings with their families or spouse. You're able to do that as well. Also note that on Saturday, February 13th at 9.30, there's a Zoom meeting with uh, UMW. They're having their kickoff for the year. Uh, And actually, a friend of mine, uh, Reverend Megan Pardue, will be leading a discussion about uh, domestic violence. Uh, You can uh, register for that. uh, at um, You can email um, the president of the Corridor District United Methodist Women, who is Jennifer Freeman, to be enrolled for that. I'd recommend it. Good stuff. Also, we're having... Uh, our Ash Wednesday service, uh, a little differently this year. On Wednesday, February the 17th, uh, we're going to be doing a drive-up service. That's uh, kind of the COVID version of how we can do Ash Wednesday this year. And so from noon to 1 p.m. in the lot that's between Front and Davis Streets, you'll be able to come up. Uh, Pastor Ross and I will be there with ashes and prayers. And we'll also have a little pamphlet for you to take home that uh, has within it some weekly practices that you can do at home uh, alone or with your families uh, in order to practice a holy Lent. We're uh, excited about an opportunity to gather with you in some brief and small way uh, despite our uh, circumstances and not being able to gather in the sanctuary. So we do hope that on Wednesday, February 17th, we'll maybe see you on your lunch break uh, from noon to 1 p.m. in the parking lot. I think that's all uh, for this week. Uh, We uh, again ask you to prepare yourselves to worship the living God as we share in this time together.
Let us pray together our opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, through Jesus, you opened the eyes of the blind. You healed the sick and you fed the hungry. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love, for the ways you restore strength to the weary and give hope to those who are in despair. We gather today being all of these things. And so make us worthy, O Lord, to receive all your gifts in this time of worship. Put your praise upon our lips and your light in our souls that we may serve you in all things. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 57, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. Let us sing together wherever we are. God is always more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. And so let us confess our sins together that we may be drawn anew into the mercies of the triune God as we pray together the prayer of confession. Merciful, most merciful God, most merciful God we confess, confess that we have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May we take this time for a time of silent personal confession before God. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love toward us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. May we join in our prayer for illumination. O Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, by Holy whose power the scriptures, scriptures become for us the word of God, God. break us open this day to receive the life that comes from the gospel so that your life might be lived through us. Amen. Our scripture for the day comes from the gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 29 through 39. Hear now this reading. 
And leaving the synagogue, they immediately went into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying down because of a fever, and immediately they told Jesus about her. Coming forward, Jesus grasped her by the hand and raised her up. The fever left her, and she began serving them. When evening had come, after the sun had gone down, the people began bringing to him all those who were sick and afflicted by demons. And the whole city was gathered at the door. Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. And he did not let the demons speak, because they knew him. Early the next morning, while it was still quite dark, Jesus got up, went outside, and went away to a deserted place, and there he was praying. Peter and those who were with him hunted him down, and upon finding him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let's go elsewhere, into the neighboring towns, so that I might preach there also. For this is why I have come forward. And he came into their synagogues throughout the whole region of Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. This is the word of God for we the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let us pray. Speak to us now, O Lord, that this word might take on flesh in us. Amen. When we go for walks together, as much as I'd like for it to be me, it is in fact my dog Gracie that sets the pace. Pulling to and fro, she reaches out to uh, sniff the spots that for her signal perhaps the presence of a rival dog or the need to mark territory or simply the joy of a new scent to be smelled. As a dog, Gracie explores the world through her nose, scents, color, her world. And so that often dictates where we end up, how long it takes for us to go for a jog or a walk. Sometimes, many times, we have to stop for a spell so that she can smell, even as we exercise together. But Gracie isn't the only one who sets a pace that affects things and people. Often, Brittany has to gently remind me that my naturally brisk pace uh, has a tendency to leave her and others behind, especially in crowds at, like, say, a concert or a trip to the state fair. I don't always pay attention to the way that I move, either independently or in relation to others. I just go. I just go. I got to get somewhere. I got to go from A to B, and please don't get in my way. And sometimes that's an issue, right, for all of us. We just go from one thing to the next, we adopt a blistering pace of life that doesn't stop long enough to notice and pay attention to what God might be calling us to be about. Discipleship requires movement, after all, but it is disciplined movement. And as it goes with our bodies, so it goes with our discipleship. If we do not move, we diminish and eventually we die. Of course, not every one of us moves at the same speed, nor do we take the same paths, but ultimately we get to the same point together. And if we bother to take notice, we find that we're all moving alongside one another, maybe in different lanes, but towards the same thing as companions, as sharers in the life of Jesus. To experience life uh, following Jesus, we should anticipate being moved from where we are into uh, not only a deeper understanding of the things of God, but a deeper mode of living in which our hearts and hands and feet pursue the mission of Jesus to do things like liberating the oppressed and establishing God's mercy as a way of life, not just for ourselves, but also uh, and perhaps even more so in some instances for others. In Mark's gospel, Jesus and the disciples move at a staggering pace from one thing to the next as the narrative thrusts us ever closer to that pivotal moment of Jesus' passion and death and resurrection. This, this pivotal moment, which is the moment on which our entire faith is built. That moment gives us perspective and purpose. It adds it to everything that comes before and to everything that follows it. The pace that Mark sets in his gospel is noticeable from its opening verses and the chapters. John's preaching, 
Then Judeans come and they're baptized. Then Jesus is baptized. Then he's thrust into the wilderness, immediately being tempted by the devil for 40 days. And then he reemerges. And what does he do? He preaches and he calls disciples and he heals the sick. And now he arrives in Capernaum. Reading Mark's gospel alone can be exhausting, but not to mention uh, uh, what feels like a real life, what it feels like in real life to try and keep up with Jesus. There's a noted pace, a disciplined pace at which Jesus moves, and it can be exhausting. However, however, this morning we zoom in a little more, and we notice how at particular times and instances, Jesus' pace with the disciples slows. And when it slows in moments like this, we find that things, that, that this moment, this instance in his life and ministry is pregnant with meaning for how Jesus heals and teaches and cares not just for others, but also for himself. Jesus has been in the hometown of his first disciples for a short while. After he calls Simon and Andrew, James and John to follow him, he moves on, he casts out a demon from somebody, he's healed some folks, he's attended worship at the synagogue where he offered a fresh interpretation of what God is doing uh, in the world through him. But their slowing movement here gives us more. There's an indication of life and transition and transformation that is taking place When Jesus slows down, we should pay attention because there is a pause that comes. Jesus and his his four fledgling disciples, they leave the synagogue in Capernaum and a short walk later, they arrive at the home of Simon and Andrew. But a fine Sabbath meal wasn't on the agenda, wasn't on the menu for them. Their movement from the synagogue to Simon and Andrew's home was not because of a dinner invitation or something good, but because of the pressing need of one of these who had given up his life or was giving up his life to follow Jesus. For Simon's mother-in-law, Jesus discovers, lies ill, unable to leave her sickbed because of a persistent fever. Now, in first century Palestine, homes weren't lived in only by mom, dad, and, and two and a half kids or whatever it is, right? Very often, you lived a crowded home life. You, your spouse, your kids, perhaps a sibling and their spouse and kids, possibly also your parents and your in-laws and whatever livestock or animals you raise to provide food and income for your family. So with perhaps a large family unit gathered about, anxious, Jesus makes his way over to Simon's mother-in-law, takes her hands and raises her from her sick bed. And yet, despite the miracle in that of Jesus raising her to new life, what happens next might even be more miraculous than that. Mark tells us that immediately, immediately, Simon's mother-in-law begins to serve them. It might be tempting to think she goes immediately back into this bustling pace of serving as the matriarch of the family or what a woman in first century Palestine might do as far as hosting duties. But what she goes back to as far as service is not busyness. The way in which Mark describes her service mirrors that of what the angels do to Jesus after his 40-day stint in the wilderness where they care for him and mend his wounds and see to his well-being. Her service rendered is a a return based on love and gratitude, a response of reverence to Jesus' goodness that has been given to her, an acknowledgement that life is abundant and full of goodness And living from that space, she begins to serve. As word gets out, the whole town gathers at the door. The whole town. Imagine Burlington coming to your door. And no one, it seems, not one, is left out of Jesus' reach to heal. He touches each one that is brought to him. Everyone's needs are great, but Jesus' ability to fulfill them is greater. And Jesus touches them all. You see here overwhelming need met with overwhelming compassion. And perhaps that kind of uh, service born out of gratitude and love, of overwhelming compassion 
coming up against overwhelming need is more of what the church can offer in a time like this. You know, right now, lines of folks are, are, are lining up at all kinds of places for a COVID-19 test. Tons of folks who are in that first wave of the vaccinations are lining up, calling, trying to get a place, uh, where, find a place where they can get uh, a vaccine administered to them. The truth is the supply is not meeting the need. And everywhere I turn, I hear about the frustrations uh, alongside small victories for those who have managed to be vaccinated. My own grandparents, I was talking to them yesterday, found it extremely difficult with their ailments to, to receive a vaccine. Uh, they try and they try and they try. And yet at the same time, I hear stories like that. I hear so many like it from, uh, from those of you who live at the village of Brookwood, uh, where many of you have been successfully vaccinated so far. It's a great and desperate need of our time, uh, the need for hope and protection amid, amid the dangerous reality of a pandemic. I imagine many of those working to administer those shots feel the overwhelming weight of that need. They need our prayers. They need our compassion. That with each passing car in person, they would be reminded that their work is noble and good. Perhaps in some way they and we feel like the desperate people who are clinging to Jesus, attempting to be healed. Perhaps in some small ways we might glimpse a little of what Jesus felt many of his days here on earth with us. Overwhelming compassion needed to meet overwhelming need. The profound needs of the folks in our community and our world can and are really overwhelming. And if there's a word for that, what the last year, almost year of grief and loss and change has been for us, overwhelming's it. Sometimes it's hard even as a church and as pastors to discern and engage where we see God at work, which is why I think it's important for us to notice and to take comfort in the fact that Jesus too, Jesus too was overwhelmed at times by the great needs around him. I think what happens next in this passage is the key to it. In the wee hours of the morning after a long evening of dark hours of healing and loving and sharing life with people, in the cloak of darkness, Jesus doesn't go to sleep. He retreats to a deserted place to pray. Because even the son of the living God wearies on the journey. Jesus removes himself to find a moment of solitude, of peace and communion through prayer. We don't know what Jesus prays, but what matters is the act itself of finding solitude when and where he could because that communion enables the movement of his life toward what the Father through the Spirit was leading, or where the Father through the Spirit was leading him. You know, perhaps one of John Wesley's most impressive spiritual disciplines was his practice of morning prayer. And by morning prayer, I mean like early morning Jesus-type prayer. Every day of good health, Wesley would wake up around four in the morning, between four and five in the morning, and dedicate those hours before daylight to focused, fervent prayer. For most of us, the thought of waking up at 4 a.m. voluntarily sounds absurd. Uh, you may even need to be uh, checked to make sure you haven't lost it, because the hours for daybreak are meant for sleeping, let's be honest, right? And yet, it was this practice of prayer, of intentional solitude, for Wesley that filled the well from which he daily drew strength. It set and sustained the pace of his life such that his ministry was lifelong and fruitful. But do note, it was not without struggle and suffering. Neither is ours. Not all of us, of course, have the space in our lives for several hours of deep morning prayer. Spirituality is not one size fits all. And yet all of us do need some anchoring practice that enlarges our capacity for communion with God, even as it mitigates the uh, unsustainable pace at which we sometimes live. Because let's, play, let's, let's face it, we often live at a, pay, a pace that leaves little space for our awareness of the presence of the Holy Trinity, whose presence is a love that you feel in the deepest parts of who you are. Busyness often gets in the way, doesn't it? Otherwise, 
How else? How else can we continue to live a life of loving God and neighbor if not anchored in the love of God? It's a love that demands from you. It says, hey, you, yes, you, busybody, allow yourself to be loved by me. This is what God, what the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to us. Allow yourself to be loved by me. How do you expect to be able to release that unsustainable pace at which you're living in order to live the space, the, the pace of life that Jesus has freed you to live if you are not willing to, to anchor yourself in practices and time set apart, to center yourself in the love that God has for you, and out of that knowledge to then live daily in pursuit of a service that is one of gratitude and love to others. The Talmud, which is an, an ancient Jewish commentary, a rabbinic commentary on the scriptures, offers this incredible perspective for us. It says, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly with God now. You're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. The Talmud's wisdom reminds us that the enormity of what is happening around us now, as well as what may come, should not overwhelm us, for it is not ours alone to carry. Neither is it ours alone to fix. Because the world's salvation has already been won on a cross on a hillside called Golgotha. Our ability to live in witness to God's victory in Christ, our energy for following Jesus into the world to heal and to be healed flows out of and only out of sustained communion with God, which can only be had when we carve out space to rest and to pray and to listen safely in the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How else can we discover in ourselves overwhelming love and gratitude for God and neighbor if we cannot see how Jesus is reaching out to us to grab our hands and to raise us up into new life? You can't pour from an empty vessel or draw from an empty well because life is not one dang thing after another happening to us. It only seems that way when we're adrift when we're unanchored to the source of our life together in God, either welling up from within inside of us or welling up from inside someone who cares about us. And so, alarmed by his absence here, this retreat, this going away, the disciples strike out in search of Jesus. Mark says they actually hunted him down like prey. It's kind of the image you get from the verbs. And when they find him, they report that not only they, but everyone in Capernaum is looking for him. Their desire for his presence and healing becomes a temptation to keep Jesus to themselves for their own ends. But Jesus is not beholden to our whims or our boxes or our borders. Jesus belongs to everyone. He's come for everyone. And so he corrects the disciples after having had a moment of solitude and communion and he relates to them that God and therefore he must remain on the move. The war being raged against the spiritual forces of wickedness and the evil powers of this world can't be confined to one location or determined by anyone independent of Jesus. We have to move forward when the time comes. And in no way does that diminish the work that has been done, but rather builds on that good by acknowledging that it should become known to and experienced by more than just me or you. It should encompass more than just what we know or what we have seen. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, paces us onward in the journey of life in Christ. The, the, the where, the when, and the what of our ministry, Jesus determines. Not our circumstances or our hang-ups. We move forward into service because we have, take, we have created the space taken the time and engaged an active communion with God. So today I challenge you, evaluate your pace. Evaluate your pace. Mindfully carve out space for communion with God in prayer, in solitude, in silence, or with those you care about the most. Leave room for that communion, that communion with God to determine your pace, your priorities, your livelihood, 
and your level of busyness. Because busyness does not determine your worth as a person. God does. Because the good news about Jesus is for everyone. Amen. What a wonderful message we had this morning. As we proceed toward the time of pastoral prayer, I'm reminded that uh, that is a time where we gather up uh, the cares of the congregation, of the church, uh, the, the things that are, are significant in the life of the congregation and offer them up to God. And I would like to invite Patrick to join me uh, to share with you something that is of significance to the life of our congregation. Friends, uh, good morning again to you. Uh, I've kind of stepped out of the pulpit now, so I'm going to speak a little more candidly, but uh, I wanted to say first that um, I love you and that there is a time and a season for everything, right? It's not a scripture that we normally think of um, when it comes to uh, perhaps transitions, but transitions are a part of life. Uh, I've been thinking lately about the, uh, the six, almost six years now that we've shared together and how over time you kind of forget uh, like that you ever like had a beginning at a place. <laughs> and, and you think that there, there may not, when you're in the middle of it, ever be an end to it in a good way. Um, and I feel like that's a sign that uh, a season has been lived in, in a full way. There's a fullness to it. And it's, it's my privilege uh, and my uh, mixed feelings of joy and sadness to share with you that uh, Brittany and I uh, have received uh, an invitation uh, to be uh, appointed anew uh, to a congregation in this coming year. That's not a decision that we make uh, lightly, not a decision that we've made uh, without prayer. It wasn't even a decision that, that we sought out. Rather, it was something that has come to us and that we feel was born on the winds of the Holy Spirit. And so... Uh, as you hear this, no doubt you're feeling some of the mixed emotions that we're feeling. Um, as, uh, as you know, the SPRC and, and the staff of the church already know this. And uh, we've already shared some, some pretty, pretty heavy moments. Um, because in the course of six years, you, you build up love for people, right? Uh, there have been times and, and a ton of memories that we've shared together that uh, for me, are some of the most profound and impactful things that I've had in my life. And I know that that's the same for Brittany. Um, and from the moment that we've been here, uh, we felt 100% loved well. From the, the tops of our head to the tips of our toes. Uh, I just want you to know that in the midst of this, we have felt and continue to feel your abiding love and sincere prayers uh, and, and gratitude. There's never been a moment I've been here that I've not felt that I was loved and, uh, and that I was thought well of uh, as your pastor. And it has been my joy to be your associate for the last six years, which is actually kind of a really long time for an associate uh, mm -hmm. to, to be in, in, in a church. Uh, and so with that, uh, with that news, know that uh, we're still going to be together for a while. This is not something that's like happening next week. This is all the way towards the end of June. Uh, but the way that we need to make this announcement now, uh, it, it's, it's due to the fact that we have to do a search process to uh, appoint another associate. And so we ask also that in this time, even as you're uh, praying for Brittany and me and loving us still, um, also be in prayer, be pointing your prayers ahead to the months to come for uh, whoever it is, he or she, that may come after me. Um, in the same way that no doubt uh, you were praying for me uh, before Nathan left. And so, friends, I love you. I'm so, so, so grateful for the ministry that we have shared, that we are sharing, that we will continue to share for the next uh, few months. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, don't go away. Don't oh, okay. Away. Sorry. Away. I know we're, we're risking closeness here <laughs> uh, because of the COVID thing. Uh, I can tell you, having done this uh, a few times, this is a difficult thing to do. Um, and as Patrick said, uh, as we are here uh, with you on Sunday morning, uh, 
this past week, we have shared this news with the staff parish committee, uh, with the staff, and um, now we share it with you. Uh, there'll be an email that goes out this afternoon to share it with those who weren't able to, to be in worship this morning. Um, and as Patrick said, uh, uh, this is a time of significance for our congregation. And I, I do ask that uh, you be in prayer uh, for Patrick and for Brittany as they uh, are honestly in this in-between time. <laughs> Uh, of knowing that they are being sent forth, but not knowing where they are being sent forth to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is a, a time that can be uh, very anxiety producing, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a time that forces us who have, have said that we will serve as United Methodist clergy uh, to trust in God all the more, um, that he will bring us to the place where he needs for us to be. And also, as he so uh, graciously uh, offered, we ask that you would be in prayer that God would bring to Front Street the person that we need uh, so that Patrick can pass that mantle uh, from him uh, to them and that they will join us in ministry and we can come alongside them as well. Uh, he's not gone yet. This is just February. And moving day is not until the end of June. And so be assured that we are working, the staff parish committee and I and uh, whoever else will be working to make sure that we have an opportunity to celebrate and uh, recognize Patrick's ministry among us. So You won't he, be seeing less of me. He, you won't <laughs> be seeing less of him between now and, and the end of June. And uh, uh, we will. Uh, have a time, r regardless of COVID. We'll figure out some way uh, to celebrate his ministry here. But let's pause for a moment of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you brought Patrick to this place, into the midst of these people, uh, into our midst, to lead us in ministry, to guide us in, in various aspects, and give us the benefit of his, uh, his call, uh, each call for each minister is unique and everybody's passioned differently and gifted differently. And we're grateful for the ways that he has shared his gifts among us. And uh, Lord, we, we know that uh, this announcement will bring uh, grief to our congregation because we've grown to love him. Be with us and give us your peace. Be with him and his family as they prepare to transition and to go into a new place, a new field of ministry. Prepare the way. And Lord, we do lift up today whoever the person is that you bring to us. We pray for their gifts. We pray uh, that they would be someone who loves you enough that they can help us to uh, engage in that uh, life of discipleship and worship and, and love of you that we so desire. So, Lord, we give this, this time to you and this space to you in our lives, and we trust it to you. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. May we take this time now as we thank God for the many ways that he has uh, shared himself with us and into the world through us, may we return to him his tithes and our gifts and offerings.
Friends, receive this benediction. May the love of God enfold you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ lead you ever onward at this pace of discipleship. And may the Holy Spirit bind us together in all truth, that in our sharing we may share love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all the other good gifts which God gives to us each and every day. Amen.